Okay, everybody, so we're moving on to this module that's following along with the textbook on uh, World War I. And so this is looking at, in the textbook, it's the chapters on Leipzig and then Constantinople, but I like to provide a little bit of a transition from the first module to the second module. So we're going to look here in the 1800s, attempts to humanize war, and what we call International Humanitarian Law, or IHL. So uh, what we're going to look at here is just some brief context on the 1800s and then talk about uh, the rules of war, which are some of the readings that I, I want you to look at. So in the 1800s, we have industrialization, the Industrial Revolution. Uh, do this little exercise uh, by yourself what comes to mind when you think of the Industrial Revolution? As soon as I say that, what pops into your head? Some students will say railroads, coal, factories, pollution, things like that. Um, and that's all, that all makes sense. Um, I've, I've got some video clips that I want to show you uh, that are taken from uh, Elizabeth Gaskell's novel, North and South, there was a BBC movie made of it. Uh, I'll put those clips up online so you can access them there. I just can't put them here in the presentation. But I want you to look at those clips because they depict what it was like to work in the factory in the 1800s and just what those conditions were like and how people were treated, uh, depending on whether you were an overseer, a manager, or just an average worker. Uh, so I'll put those up and you can watch those and, and tell me what you think of them. But industrialization, industrial revolution uh, brought a lot of advances, not just in communication and transportation, but also in photography. This is something that often gets overlooked. We, we go to the big things like the steam engine or the telegraph, but photography was uh, a, a huge change, technological uh, advance in the 1800s. And so I want to show you uh, two images. The first is a photograph, and just a warning, this is a, a photograph of the U.S. Civil War of a dead body. And then I'll show you a, a drawing. So here's the image of uh, the Civil War, the American Civil War, and you can see very clearly that there's a dead body here in the foreground surrounded by rocks, lots of rocks all around. This person's in some kind of a trench. Okay, and so that's the photograph. Take a moment just to look at that. Here's a drawing of uh, the devastation of war and, and a battle. Uh, and so here's a, 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 like a pencil sketch. You can see an individual here in the background who was sort of staring on, perhaps weeping, and then you can see all of these uh, dead bodies here in the foreground. What is the difference between those two images? Do they evoke the same emotions? Or is there no difference, really? When you see a graphic image like this, do you react the same way as if you see a graphic a, photo a photograph, do you react the same way? Something I want you to think about, something that I think is very important, these are more images taken during the 1800s, this is actually in the US, but you, you can see that these small boys are huddled together trying to stay warm, they don't have shoes on, uh, you also have an image here of a young girl working in a factory, and uh, she's just staring, staring into the camera. I don't know what she's feeling, but it looks like um, you know, there's, there's a connection there between you and me as the viewer and then this individual as the subject of the photograph. The point that I want to get to here about photography and why it matters is that photography uh, lends itself to empathy. When we see a real person, human being just like us, either suffering or uh, dying, or in some cases a deceased person, uh, it can flare up certain feelings within us. And in some cases that can lead to empathy. 
where we put ourselves in their place and try to understand their perspective. This is going to have an impact on uh, the, the rules of war that are coming and why the, the nations of the world, uh, especially in the West, are coming together in the 1800s to try to put restrictions and limitations on war. They're beginning to see just how uh, uh, terrible war can be. An example of a war during this time period is the Crimean War in the mid-1850s. I only mention that as an example. Uh, the Crimean Peninsula is south of Russia, and uh, there was a war fought there. The, the war is significant because it saw the use of uh, breech-loading rifles and machine guns, if I'm not mistaken. I'd have to go back and look at my notes, but the Crimean War saw advances in uh, military technology, uh, in part because of the Industrial Revolution. So, that's just an example of a war. Now, we're going to start seeing rules uh, being written down about war. There are some examples that I want you to look at from the Lieber Code, the Geneva Convention, and then the Hague Conventions. So, um, those take place in the middle of the century and then at the very end, going into the early 1900s. Just some questions to be thinking about. How... How do these agreements attempt to humanize war? Should there be rules of war? Uh, one of the things I think you'll notice as you go through uh, these documents is that the, um, the rules of war become more specific over time. And then once we do look at the First World War, and of course the Second World War too, but when we get to 19... 14 and the world begins, uh, you're going to see a lot of these rules not being followed. So is there any point in even having them if no one's really going to follow them? The um, couple of things that uh, are not in the reading, so I have to just mention them here. The 1899 Hague Convention saw uh, something called the Martin's Clause. I'll read it to you. Uh, this, it's just this paragraph, and it says, until a more complete code of the laws of war is issued, the high contracting parties think it right to declare that in cases not included in the regulations adopted by them, populations and belligerents remain under the protection and empire of the principles of international law as they result from the usages established between civilized nations from the laws of humanity and the requirements of the public conscience. What does all that mean? Uh, essentially, this is a clause to cover all their bases. They're admitting that this is not complete. What we've worked on at this con peace conference is incomplete. Uh, and so if we forgot to include anything that we should have included, we want this general guideline to uh, be in place where uh, people are still protected under principles of international law, uh, from customs between civilized nations, from the laws of humanity and the requirements of the public conscience. So this is an early form of what we would consider human rights. When we see this phrase, the laws of humanity, that is a different term, but it's describing a similar concept to what we would consider to be human rights. And so I want you to be aware of that here in this, this uh, 1899 Hague Convention. In the 1907 Hague Convention, um, they did want to have a third peace conference in eight years. So if you just do the math, that would have been 1915. That conference never happened. That was right in the middle of World War I. So they had called for a peace conference, but it never took place. What I'd like for you to begin working on as we move into World War I, uh, there's a video that you can watch, a uh, crash course video, John Green. I think he's engaging, talking about the causes of World War I. But then uh, this book from uh, Helena Zena Smith, Not So Quiet, Stepdaughters of War. Uh, begin looking at that book. Uh, we'll look at all the chapters. I've only listed half of the chapters here. Uh, but just begin reading the book. It's about these uh, English women, women from England, 
who drive the ambulances to and from the front lines to transport wounded soldiers. Uh, the title of the book is a reaction to uh, the book All Quiet on the Western Front. And this book makes it very clear that it was not quiet where, where these women were working. The story is fictional, but it's based on true events. And so it's a, it's a dramatization of things that happened during the First World War for, for these women. Uh, things to think about as you begin to read it. So how does it depict war? How does it depict nationalism? Those two are really important for our course. And of course, don't overlook, don't overlook the class differences between uh, the different groups of women who are represented. And then gender, gender roles how these women are, are taking on uh, different gender roles than just being in the house. So that's all I've got, everybody. Have a really great day, and I'll see you online.